Welcome to another episode of Strictly Education. I am your host, Dr. Tahira. Summer is coming to an end, and we can already feel the seasons changing. The back-to-school commercials are flooding our television and social media, and I see teachers are posting their classroom decorations and professional trainings all over social media. As we prepare to reopen our doors of our nation's schools for the 2024-2025 school year, let's talk about college and career readiness for school districts across America. We're charged to prepare our nation's youth for college and career readiness. Now, before we get started, let's break down what does college and career readiness actually mean. Well, according to the United States Department of Education, a college and career ready student is defined as one who is prepared to go directly to work or enroll and succeed without remediation in a variety of post-secondary institutions so that they are ready to enter a career of their choice. That sounds pretty simple, right? Well, according to a new analysis of scores from ACT, college admissions tests, only one in five high schoolers in the class of 2023 graduated ready to succeed in their core introductory classes in college, even though most believe they were well prepared. What's more, nationwide high school graduates scored 19.5 out of 36 on the ACT. That's down 0.3 percentage points from last year. And by the way, that is 32 year low composite score. While the drop has been faster since the pandemic began in 2020, college readiness has been on the decline for more than a decade, according to ACT. More than 40% of new graduates didn't meet ACT's college readiness benchmarks in any subject, and only 21% met benchmarks in all four. So this begs the question, are we really producing students who are ready for college level work or to enter the workforce prepared for today's job? While many educators, such as myself, are constantly reviewing data and sifting through mounds and mounds of research, Strictly Education decided to ask the end users, our nation's students, if they believe they were college and career ready by the time they graduated from high school and entered college. How often do we get to ask the end user about their thoughts and opinions to help shape our decision making on what educational journey should look like for students? During this episode, we will be intentional about not revealing the high school they attended, but to discuss their college experiences. You didn't think I was going to reveal the place of their formal education, right? We're not that kind of show. Our work as school leaders is hard enough. You don't need someone like me to pounce all over a particular school or school district. I am here for solutions. As we open our nation's schools, I hope school leaders will hear the perspective of these bold and brilliant young people on my show, our end users, and consider making changes as needed to ensure that we meet the needs in every aspect to truly prepare them for college and the world of work. So let's get into it. Welcome to the show. I am probably one of the luckiest hosts in the world because I get to spend time with young people, people who've gone through the K-12 experience, whether it's private school, parochial school, public school, entered college. Some of you have entered the world of work this year. Congratulations to the graduates of class of 2024 who are sitting on this dais and my virtual guests. Today, we're going to focus on you and we're going to focus on your experience. I like to call you all the end users because oftentimes in education, we make decisions and we make decisions with adults sitting around the table. We don't do enough of asking our end users how such decisions impact them. And as I said in the introduction, we were charged as school leaders and you guys know I'm a school superintendent to prepare young people such as yourselves for college and career readiness. It's almost like a phrase that we constantly hear about, but most people don't understand what that phrase means. Mm -hmm. So what we'd like to do today at Strictly Education is to find out if in fact we have prepared you for college. Did you feel prepared going in? And some of you have just entered the world of work. And I'd like to know, do you actually feel prepared? But before we get started, I want my Strictly Education audience to know who you are, because first, I am so proud of each and every one of you. I'm proud of the journey that you've all been on. I know pretty much all of your journey, right? Your journey that you've been on and where you are today. And so I want people to know who you are. Give us your name. 
Tell us what school you currently attend. We're not going to talk about the high school where you went, but the school that you currently attend. And also tell us your major. So we're going to start with our virtual friends. Jackie, let's take it from, let's, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Jackie, and I just graduated from Fordham University in the Bronx in May, and I got a Bachelor of Arts in Art History. Welcome, Jackie. Sanaya? Hi, my name is Sanaya Underwood. I'm a senior, and I currently attend the University of Alabama at Birmingham. All right. And tell us your major again, Sanaya. I'm a sports communications major, and I minor in sports marketing and entertainment. Awesome. 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 And Joe? Hi, my name is Joe. I'm a senior at Clemson University. I'm currently studying Chinese and international health. Um, that combines the language component with the international health, and I'm pre-med, so hoping to um, go to med school next year. Wow, wow. And let's go to our in-person studio audience. We'll start with the other Joe who's on the stage with us. Joseph? I'm Joseph. I recently graduated in May from the University of Mount St. Vincent. Um, I was a sociology major with a minor in um, Criminology. Awesome. Awesome. I'm Skylar. Um, I'm a senior at Clemson University. Um, I'm a packaging science major with a minor in Chinese studies. All right. And last but certainly not least. I'm Hershita. I attend the university at Buffalo and I'm currently studying public health. What are you studying again? Public health. Public health. You guys have some very strong majors here. You're kind of putting me to shame, right? <laughs> you guys are really, you're really doing some awesome things and you're going to be awesome change makers like you guys are the future wow so let's talk about your k-12 experience was there anything in your experience in your k-12 journey that's kindergarten through grade 12 that have inspired you to choose the major you have chosen i'm going to start with virtual joe um actually no i wanted nothing to do with pre-med for a while uh, i wanted to do music actually for a long time and i had one good chemistry teacher and one good biology teacher that really kind of pushed me towards that that pre-med you know realm to even think that i could do that um i hated science so and they just made me love it so I, I had two good teachers and i think that's really all it takes sometimes is just one or two good teachers to push you in that direction all it takes, audience, is one or two good teachers to push you in a direction. We're going to put a pin in what Joe said because that is quite significant. I'm going to go to my in-person. Harshita, anything in your K-12 experience that may have inspired you to major in what you're doing now? I would say yes. I've changed my major a couple of times actually in college. <laughs> Um, so definitely it, throughout like elementary school, I was like, law, 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 law. Like I'm going to be a law girl when I go to college. And then like high school, I was like, wait, I really like science. And like, I have like doctors in my family. And I was like, maybe I want to be a doctor. Like law was like completely like out the way. Then I went to college, I started pre-dental. Oh. And then after my first year, I was like, hold on, like college science is not the same as high school science. So then I had to like retrack. Then I completely changed to business management. Oh wow. <laughs> Don't ask me <you> right. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, like I took some like economics classes. It was certainly something that was relatable to what was going on in the world. And then I was like, wait, like there's, I had to take a prerequisite, which was a general education requirement. Sure. I had to take public health. And I was like, wait, this is like kind of like the law girl that I had in like elementary school with an incorporation of like the medical field. Sure. And I was like, I think this is like my strong suit. So like ah. now I'm studying public health and I think like that's where I'm gonna stay right. hopefully. And that's okay, and that's okay. Good stuff, very good. Jackie, what about you? Anything happened in K-12 that inspired you to major in what you've done and what you're, well, I guess what you currently graduated, what you received your bachelor's degree in? Yeah, so I was always just a very creative kid. I loved art, I loved music, I loved drama, and I was fortunate enough to do a lot of that K through 12. And I did AP art, I did art all throughout high school, but I always was super interested in the history side of it. And it was our ninth grade history class. We had a two week unit on art history and I never forgot about it. I loved it so much that it was something that I took in college as part of the core curriculum and I never dropped it. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I got to take it all four years of college and I loved it. That's awesome. Awesome. Skylar, what about you? Anything in your K-12 journey? Well, I always believed I wasn't a math or a science student because I was never good at math or science. It was actually a woman who inspired me to go into my major. 
Um, and she mentored me throughout, and that's what made me go into packaging. But in terms of throughout my high school career, no, I was never really, um, that was never my strong suit, math nor science. Okay. Yeah. All right, but you're going, but you're in a major that requires you to use a lot of math and science. Yeah, I think once I got into college, it just started to click. But in high school, um, I was very discouraged from math and science. Okay. Yeah. Hold that. We're gonna we're gonna come back to that as well. Sanaya, virtual Sanaya. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything in your K twelve journey that inspired you to want to go into sports broadcasting? Um, other than me playing sports, no, I always felt like K through 12, I either had to become a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, go into business. There really aren't like a lot of classes like K through 12 that offer like the media experience from where I'm from. Okay. All right. But what, so what sparked you into wanting to take that as a major then? When I got to college, I was like really focused on nursing, not because like I liked it and everything, but that's what my dad wanted me to be. That's not what I wanted. So mm -hmm. once I like got here and I got around different people and like I got to explore, that's when I figured, I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. And it's, it's fun. And I'm around things that I love watching and doing. So that's awesome. Very good. Thank you. And in person, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about your K-12 journey. Was there anything in that in journey that the net journey that inspired you to take the major that you just graduated from? Um, so like K through 12, you know, like when I was younger, like I didn't really I wasn't really paying mind to like what I wanted to do or what I was gonna do in college up until you know high school started. And I kinda always knew like I wanted to go into like the field of like criminal justice, law enforcement, something along those lines. And you know, I picked the brains of a lot of my teachers because they were retired police officers and I was interested in you know criminal justice that was always I want to do criminal justice criminal justice and then speaking to all these teachers you know they mentored me through through high school they were like you don't need to uh, study criminal justice you'll learn that when when you get the job so they kind of mentored me and told me uh, give yourself something else major in something maybe similar but not exactly criminal justice and you know, it, it showed that I could put something else on my resume or or just stand out from from others. Um, and it just like broadened my my yeah. knowledge. So sociology, I thought was like the perfect uh, major for me because it was kind of general, but I was able to like get a taste of like different fields and right. learn different things. That's awesome. I want to piggyback on something virtual Joe shared. Mm -hmm. uh, he talked about teachers yeah. being an inspiration or just being sparked by a teacher. I've always said, you know, I was in the classroom for 13 years as a teacher before going into school leadership. And so I always believe that a teacher has probably the biggest influence on a student's thinking about him or herself, the belief in him or herself, the building of self-confidence, the belief that you can do and be anything that you wanna be. A teacher oftentimes has that great influence. Joe, can you just talk about how those teachers influenced you? Yeah, so my um, sophomore year of high school, I had a just a general chemistry course, and it was with a teacher that I don't think a lot of people actually liked very much. Um, she was kind of abrasive and just very, you know, hard, crack down on grades kind of person. And I did not think I was going to do good in chemistry at all, but she really fostered this, I don't know, love of chemistry, a love of science in me that I didn't really have before. Um, and my grades slowly started improving. I got an A in her class. And um, by the end of my four years of high school, we pick a teacher to write a note for us. And they, they write a note to kind of send us on our way. And that's just the way my high school did it. And I think I was the only person who picked her. And she just gave me this moment. I felt note about how she wants me to go to Clemson. And she went to Clemson and, and that I love studying chemistry and she hopes I keep doing it. So it just that, that right there just really solidified, you know, I can do what I want to do and if I just really put in hard work. That's uh, yeah. amazing. Anyone else virtual or in person has had a teacher who inspired you to really believe in yourself? Um, I've had teachers like throughout my high school experience and it's really important that they saw me as just more than a student. Like they saw me as a human being first and they made sure like I was okay mentally like outside the classroom and everything was okay, like at home, because obviously if everything is like, if you don't have like 
if everything's not okay at home and things are going on in your life, you're obviously not going to do good in the classroom. So they saw more like potential in me than I saw in myself. And that really like helped me and really like push my boundaries on how much like I'm able to do now. And it's just really amazing. Like I wouldn't really be here without them. So that's amazing. Anyone else? Um, I had a teacher in particular in mind. Can I, I don't know if I can say names, but not yet. Okay. Well, I'm going to give uh, you an opportunity to give those teachers a shout out soon, but go ahead. Yeah. I had a teacher when I went to, was it when I was in high school and he really was invested into me and it was like, almost like he was like my second father at home. Oh. I mean, in school. So, um, having him around was just always, I always felt comfortable just talking to him and just telling him how I felt about school or just like home and things of that sort. So I think it's really important for all students just to have like a safe space or like a friend or someone that like is a family figure at home. So it just doesn't feel like work, work in school. You have like a, a place where you can release. Awesome. Anyone else? I agree with everything that everyone said. <laughs> um, like, there's nobody, like, specific, like, particularly. But, like, growing up, like, I always just loved seeing, like, women in high positions. Like, anybody in a high position that, like, was able to be personable with, like, you're able to talk to me, like, me, like, little old me, like, in elementary school. Like, I don't know, like, it always, like, pushed me to, like, want to be there. So, like, even though, like, even if I do a, a, a major that's, like, doesn't have, there's a leader in every major. I don't care what anybody says. Right. So, like, being a high, like, higher up, like, woman, like, improving people wrong and saying, like, I can do this. Like, I don't need you to, like, give me confirmation. I'm going to show it to you. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, that pushed me. And, like, even, like, there was, like, people like in school, like principals, teachers that like pushed me to do stuff that I never saw myself doing. Wow. So like that like pushed me to be who I am today. That's <laughs> awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. I'm going to talk about the opposite. Have you ever had an experience with a teacher in your K-12 journey that could have served, obviously they didn't, could have served as a detriment to your journey? While you're thinking about that, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. I had a guidance counselor who told me that college was not an option, who discouraged me from applying to college. Who, and this was my guidance counselor. And I'll never forget sitting in his office and hearing his words, looking me in my eyes and in my face, telling me, you really should not consider college. You might want to think about taking a civil service test and just going into the workforce. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. But he discouraged me from wanting to consider college, and I thank God I didn't listen to him because I don't think that I'd be sitting here as your host of Strictly Education nor superintendent of schools. So, you know, imagine the other students under his care whom he may have said those same words to and took heed to his words because he is someone of influence. He's the guidance counselor. Have you guys ever had a negative experience with someone who may have been a detriment, who could have been a detriment? I think I saw your... Um, well, like, my, in my case, like, COVID was certainly, like, a discouragement for, like, a lot of us. So, like, that was, like, my junior year, my sophomore year, like, the core years of high school, which is going to make or break your future, you know, for, like, what you want to do. Like, you don't know what you want to do. You're confused. You don't have human contact with, like, the people that are supposed to motivate you, Got you know? You. So, like, in my case, like, my senior year when we did return back in person, like, I don't think teachers, guidance counselors, or staff, like, knew how much of an impact they had in that one school year. Mm. And, like, I don't know, like, we kind of were all over the place. Like, nobody had it all together, like, understandable. But, like, a, in a lot of cases, like, teachers weren't really in tune, like, with what was going on with the students because they were so focused on bettering, like, you know, how we get back to what, like, yeah. we have to be. But, like... Yeah that was our senior year. Right. Like, we were trying to orientate the classroom, sure. but, like, we didn't know what we were going to get into in the following year. So, like, I think that took a huge toll on not only me, but my whole entire class. Yeah. Um, that's my opinion. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that, and thank you for your honesty about that. Anyone else?
Yeah, I have an experience as well. Um, it was also my senior year of high school. So right before COVID, um, I was in an advanced placement class. I was in an accelerated class that worked very quickly and you had to have work done. And I just felt like my teacher specifically always called me out for things. And I felt like there was a difference between constructive criticism and just downright rudeness. And so I would try and tell myself and be like, okay, is this a constructive criticism moment or is this the teacher has it out for me? And more times than often, I felt like the teacher had a target on my back. And that was really difficult because it made me very just discouraged with a subject that I really loved right. and that I really liked. And it was frustrating and it was definitely just hard to navigate when I felt like I was doing everything that I could, but everything I was doing was still not enough and not done correctly. Wow. Harshita and Jackie, I'm so sorry for those experiences just as an educator. Um, but I am just also proud that you were able to overcome and persevere. Look at what you ladies are doing now. You are amazing. And so despite those challenges that you may have had, I think that you rose above them. And that's a wonderful skill set to have that even if you have negative experiences, that it's how you handle them, the resilience, the perseverance. And those skill sets are what you're going to need for the rest of your life. Because you're going to run into people who are not going to be extremely kind to you, who are not going to be forgiven and patient <laughs> with you. That's a part of life, but it's how you handle it. And it's just maintaining that self-confidence, maintaining the mindset that you are amazing, you are phenomenal, phenomenally you know, designed and you are uniquely designed and you are who you are and remaining in your authentic self, you will just overcome any obstacle. Anyone else have an experience that they'd like to share that didn't really set well with you during your- I might have one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a long time ago. I think I was in like fifth grade. And wow. I know now like math is in my strong suit. Um, and I've, I've kind of always known that for a long time. Um, but I had this one like teacher and she kind of knew, I mean, teachers grade our tests and do our homework. Like they, they know who's doing good in math, who isn't doing that well. And, you know, I knew I struggled with it. I tried to get the help uh, from my brother who was also really good at math. But, you know, I, I just, with numbers, I just never got it. Yeah. And like, I remember like end of the school year came and she's doing, I guess she was doing report cards and progress reports and stuff. And she like called me over. Like everyone's in the class and she, everyone's like doing their own thing, but you know, all my friends are sitting there and she, she calls me to her desk in the front of the classroom and she's like, you're not gonna pass uh, this year to go to the next grade because uh, of math. And I'm like, really? Like and my, I've gone to the teacher before to tell her in fifth grade, like, hey, I'm, I need help with math. And she's giving me the, the things I needed to move forward. And, and she told me like that and I mean, as a fifth grader, I'm like, well, you're telling me this and like, I'm mm. kind of in front of all my friends. Yeah. Like, what, do you, what are you gonna, like, what can I do? And then, I mean, I don't know what, somehow, some way, like, um, you know, I spoke to my parents and they spoke to her and I, I'm like, look, I, I was trying. Like, it's not like I just didn't do any work or anything. Um, I did pass the class and everything, but you know, that stuck with me because she like blatantly told me like, yeah, you're not gonna go yeah. to the next grade. And I mean, I did, thank God, yeah. but. Yeah, and how she yeah. made you feel, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, just as a teacher, and you know, even though I'm a superintendent, I'm always a teacher, and I will always be a teacher. As a teacher, you know, we have to be really careful about how we make students feel, because you all are very impressionable. Like, you're building your, you're building your own capacity, and you're becoming your authentic self as you're going through that K-12 journey. And so how we make you feel is so very important. And even if you are a student who might be struggling in a particular area, just how we share you know, um, the status of where you are is so very important because like Joseph's experience, I could have shared with him that you know, he might be struggling. Hey, here's what we can do. I have some contact hours. That would have made a difference as opposed to embarrassing you in front of your friends and making you feel that way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, we have to be really careful of what we say to students because it really does matter. So Naya, I think you wanted to say something and then we'll move on. Um, yeah, I feel like we all had the same, I don't know. I feel like we've all had like the same teacher kind of discourage us in a way from hearing everybody's story. But I'll never forget, it was my eighth grade year and I was taking AP math because I like had done so well. And I generally like did like math up until that point. It's just everybody else like got it and everybody else's learning style is completely different. But this teacher would like make jokes like in front of the class about like me taking my time and how I wasn't like 
on fast pace and everything, which I understood it was an AP class, but also it was very like discouraging and it like belittled my self confidence because I was already going through a lot like outside of school. So never took an AP math class after that again. I still don't like math, but I mean the, the little things like matter and it like has an impact on you. Yeah, it really does. And and the fact that it actually changed your feelings about mathematics, you know, that I'm so sorry. And I'm sorry for each of one of your experiences, but I also believe in my heart that for that one negative experience that you may have had, or maybe two negative experiences, you probably had fantastic experiences with educators, with school leaders, with counselors, yeah. and so many other people. Because look at you guys, you guys are amazing. So I'm pretty sure you had amazing experiences. But let's talk a little bit about social emotional support. I know college is tough. I remember my college days, right? No one prepared me for what I was about to enter in college. Um, I went to an HBCU. I went to Norfolk State University. Behold the green and gold. I will <laughs> always be a Spartan forever and ever and ever. Um, and I just remember the coursework, the course load, you know, being on this campus, Jackie, with people I've never met before because I wasn't the K-12 with them, right? And all of a sudden, it's a whole new thing. And then there are professors, right? And maybe they weren't just as nurturing as it was in the K-12 experience. I don't know. But college is different. Mm -hmm. A lot of college students face depression, anxiety, test anxieties, and so many other feelings. How do you cope with the social emotional aspect of college? And what are some of those experiences you may have had? Skyla? So I entered college during COVID. Oh, so my I experience. Swear. Who else entered college during COVID? Me, I did. You did, you did, you did, you did. Samaya, you did too? Joe, you didn't? Okay. All right. So it was a very hard to meet people because everything was so like socially distanced. Everybody was isolated and we were still doing hybrid classes. So I would go to class like twice a week like in actually face to face and everybody had masks. So it was really hard to communicate with people and things of that sort. But after COVID, um, it can be like a little, I guess, um, intimidating. I can see for like a freshman because you're new, you don't know anybody, it's, especially if you go to school like ours, like mine, Clemson University is such a big school. We have like 20,000 students. So it was like, where do I even start? So I think in terms of social, emotional, um, it's it's really hard, I think, to just meet people because how like as a freshman, how do you meet people? Okay. How do you get yourself out there? Right. Especially if you go to a, a high school where you met people K through twelve, you were with the same people, right. like my high school. So right. I wasn't really with my friends, so I had to really like branch out. But it also pushed me to like learn a lot about myself mm. since I'm so far from home, and I really got to learn things that I don't think I would have learned if. I didn't go to such a big school or if I wasn't around so many different type of people. And I also wouldn't know how to communicate with so many different type of people because I'm going to school with people who are totally different than me. So I think it's really important for high school to bring in students of all different backgrounds and all different places so people can know how to communicate with all people. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. So I wanted to stick on the topic of social emotional. Social emotional support. Like, do you guys feel that high school prepared you for the social emotional aspect of college? Um, um, I would say no, not really, okay. in my opinion. Because like at the time, like when I was in high school, like social emotional like learning, like that was just newly introduced in my district. So like the teachers took it as if it was a task rather than this is to help our students. So like when, as students, like, you know, like we're in high school, like sometimes like we have teachers we don't like, we don't want to listen to them. Like that's everybody, it happens everywhere. So like when this teacher is putting it onto you, like, no, you have to do this. You have to do this activity. This is what we're told to do. You have an hour to do this activity. Just talk amongst yourself, figure it out. Like, you know, like it became a task. It wasn't essentially like what the like goal of the initiative was supposed to be so like it was just uh it's a social emotional day like forget it it's a free day like we're not really but like the background of the activities that we actually had to do could have really had a positive impact on everybody except the way that it was inputted on us was not like a voluntary thing it was like a mandatory thing i understand i understand 
Uh, virtual Joe, I see you from my peripheral shaking your head and not in your head in agreement. Similar experience? Well, I just wanted to say, um, you got to think when you're in high school, you live with your parents still. So you have that emotional support from your home system. Um, the, the high school usually doesn't think they need to implement it as much onto you because you have that at home. So that you always have your, your parents or your siblings or whatever your family unit is to fall back on. You don't really have to get that at, in high school. Um, and then when you get to college, it's a, it's a whole different experience. You know, now you have more resources to utilize, but you don't know how to utilize them because you've been relying on your family this whole time or relying on whatever friends you have. And they live down the road and da, 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 you know, so you really have to, like Skylar said, find a good friend group and make good friends and be able to fall back on those friends or you will 100 percent fall behind emotionally and 100 percent will fall behind in a social aspect. Okay. Jackie, do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I also feel like I definitely agree. And I think what Joe said, and he made a really good point that when you go to college, there's so much resources available, you almost don't know what to do. And it can be a little overwhelming. But I think luckily enough, I went to a high school where we were just very prepared. Um, but at the same time, it was a very competitive environment. Um, going to like an independent high school, it was definitely very competitive, still supportive, but you could always feel that. And I think it was definitely just a big transition having like packed days from 7 a.m. to 6 30, and then like having a very rigid routine to then going to college where it was just a little bit more flexible, having more time in between classes, not having classes on any days, and having full days off. Personally, was definitely just an adjustment that I had to work through because I went from just such packed rigid routine to a little more a little bit more flexibility and I think that is something that I wish I was taught more about in high school I think I was taught to be so structured and to have a great routine and it gave me great time management skills it gave, gave me great organization skills but I was not very flexible when I got to college and that was hard and that was a hard adjustment. All right, so I see in person Joseph sort of smiled and smirked when you spoke, Jackie. So I think what you said resonated with him. Talk to us. Yeah, well, definitely with everybody. And like, I, I agree with everyone on everything, but like having that structure, like my high school, very, very strict, a lot of structure. Um, you know, I, it was an all boys school. That's uh, so with that, like, you know, High school, all boys, and then going to college. My college is co-ed, as most colleges are. And that's a totally different environment than yeah. what I was used to. Right. And, you know, that transition was hard because I'm also COVID class of mm -hmm. class 2020 from high school. Transitioning from COVID, like missing out senior year of high school, then hybrid classes, and then going to college with having a mask on was, like, super hard. And there's not a book on, oh, how do you get through this? And, mm -hmm. like, I'm expecting college to be like you see on the movies, on TV, and what maybe your older family members describe, right. oh yeah, right. you go to college, first day you make a bunch of friends. Right. And then it's like, okay, I'm like thinking on my first day, okay, I go, and you know, everyone's wearing a mask, everyone's like spread out, like you can't really talk to anybody. And yeah, I mean, high school, I think helped me in a way with at least maybe having some structure, right. but like having so much structure to then go to college where it was just like, you kind of make your own schedule, you do your own thing. Right. You make your, you do it however you want. It's not like classes 8 to 9 p.m. Okay. or like, but yeah. All right. So I have a question for you guys. You're going to give me some advice. You've already demonstrated to my Strictly Education audience that you are probably among the brightest in the country, if not the world. So I'm super lucky to have you guys here and honored to have you as my guests. Really, you all bright. You are, even though you went through the COVID experience, you know, you guys are at the top of your game. You know, you're doing exceedingly well and you have demonstrated what resilience and what perseverance should look like. And you make me, you give me hope for the future, all six of you. You give me hope. And I'm sure that you give my Strictly Education audience hope for the future. So I'm gonna ask you to give principals, teachers, superintendents like myself, directors, school boards, advice. What can they implement in their high schools to better prepare future students and current students for the world of college. Forget work, because I know some of you just graduated. We'll talk about that in a second. But just to better prepare them for college, what advice would you give someone like myself as a superintendent? You see, I love taking advice for students because you are the end users. And I'd like to know what it is that people like myself can do better 
for your younger brothers and sisters and those who come behind you? Who wants to take that one? What advice would you give? Jackie. I can start. Um... I'm taking copious notes, honey. Okay, I'm not exactly sure if this is like quite what you're looking for, but something that I always felt and like a lot of my friends college, like we kind of just discussed this, that we always kind of wish there was a class that was just like basic life skills. Like I think, for example, a really big one was learning how to budget in college. And personally for me, I went to college in New York City um, and I loved it, but it's expensive and it adds up. And I think I would have loved to just learn how to kind of manage that a little bit more. Um I think also just some other stuff like working, like learning how to make a resume and like how to kind of network with people. Because although you do learn that in college, it was definitely very overwhelming. I would have loved to learn that a little bit sooner. So just like some basic life skills. I think having a class like that or even just like maybe like a week long event, like getting especially for high school seniors, I think it would have been extremely helpful. OK, so superintendents, principals, high school principals in particular. You're hearing it from an end user. I think that's a brilliant idea for the senior class to have at least a week long, you know, course or or some sort of the word is just escape me right now, but some sort of um, opportunity um, for seniors just to learn how to transition to college, how to budget, how to you know transition safely, calmly, respectfully into college. I really like that idea. Who else? Anyone else? Any other advisement you'd like to give? Harshita? And then Joe? Harshita? Um, so like I think a huge difference between college and like high school is like how you're taught. So like a lot of like I go to a big university, so like it's all lecture based. Like in college, like I could raise my hand in a 20 person class and like the teacher will come to my desk and explain something to me. But like in college, like you don't have that. You have to go to office hours. Like you have to write notes while they're talking, try not to fall asleep, like all of that. Like it's like, you know, like, so like I think like implementing maybe like lectures can be the death of some people, but like, I don't know, like, slowly like implementing it in like high schools like could have prepared I know I don't know like myself other students like for what to expect maybe not changing the whole curriculum to be lecture based of course not because obviously that's like the glory of high school like you're able to like talk to your teacher you're able to get that in person like contact immediately right away but like having that resource just to know what to ex yeah. <clears throat> just what to expect when you go to college yeah. like I don't know I think it will be beneficial I like that I like that superintendents directors school board members principals I like that maybe transitioning from a traditional traditional school setting to a lecture base so that students can get acclimated to what that lecture base coursework will look like that may not be a bad idea maybe for a few classes or maybe in the senior year it's more lecture based not a bad idea hearing you from an end user joe you have a recommendation yeah i think while it's great that we instill our students with you know being able to do whatever they want, be whatever they want. Um, unfortunately, we don't often provide the options. And I mean, the teachers of America do not always provide, you know, what options you have. And um, like I said, I think college is great. I think it's um, amazing to go to college and get a higher education, but I don't think that is for everyone, for sure. And I think you even mentioned just going into the workforce is an important, you know, aspect of our country. And a lot of our teachers don't instill that in our students so there's always trade school there's always you know going into blue collar work right out of college and those options aren't provided to a lot of students and maybe i have a college brain but i had a lot of you know friends and and even family members my age who was like you know what i don't i don't think you're college material i think you might be better in this you know aspect of our country and i think that's amazing it's just not instilled in us so I think even even with the lecture thing, options for students, you want to do lecture notes or, or PowerPoints. We do that in college. Like if you want to download the PowerPoint, do your own notes because the lectures may not be for you. You know, I think more options would help solve a lot of problems across, you know, across the board. So Joe is probably going to be the next secretary of education. And <laughs> I would definitely like endorse that. He is absolutely right. We need to normalize in this country alternatives to college because not everyone has a college brain. That's not everyone's trajectory. Vocational schools, right? So there are many students that can go into a vocation, get a certification, right? Um, and then really obtain a very lucrative job where they can contribute successfully 
and responsibly to our country and be able to take care of their families and contribute to the community. In my school district in particular, Joe, I think you'll be proud of us. We introduce electrical training where we provide certifications to our scholars once they graduate and they can go straight into the industry. Of course, they have to obtain a certain amount of hours and they can actually go into the industry. And what we've learned during the pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, is that we've learned that we have to look at jobs that will sustain themselves through a crisis such as the pandemic, right? It got to be pandemic proof. Being an electrician is one. You're going to need an electrician. You're going to need people in the medical profession. Teachers aren't going anywhere. We're going to need teachers. We are dying for more teachers in this country because we do have a national shortage. So there are so many professions that are pandemic proof and that no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what crisis happens, that we're still going to need those professions, right? But we do need to normalize the vocational studies mm -hmm. because college isn't for everyone. And it's okay if you don't choose that route. It's okay if you go into the workforce. Joe, it's okay if you go into the military. That's awesome if you go into the military straight out of college. And we need to have more conversations about variety of pathways so that you can have a successful life. Totally agree with that. Any other advisements? Anybody else has advice for principals? Yes. Um, Sanaya, and then we'll go to the okay. in-person. Yes. Um, I'd say like focusing more on that transition because I know for me coming from high school and being like a 3.8, 4.0 GPA student and then coming to college and getting my first C, it's a very humbling moment. Um, we don't talk about that transition enough. Um, I also feel like, and I don't know, I, I don't know if you guys, but like the bill that has just been passed here with diversity and equity here in the state of Alabama, um, they're trying to make history like just as simple as white and black. And history was like, it wasn't that, it's not that simple. It still isn't because history repeats itself. And I feel like the children now, they're learning more like history and education off of TikTok and Instagram than they are in the classroom. And I think that's like a really big problem because I didn't know a lot about history until I got to college because they make it seem so simple and it's not, it's not that simple. History is not that simple. History is not that simple and it is very important. It is also the responsibility of school districts to be very responsible in teaching American history and that American history does involve all folks no matter where they may have immigrated from and we have to be responsible in teaching it. Just look at my panel. You guys are a beautiful mosaic and a beautiful representative of what America looks like. And I'm just so proud to have you all on this panel. So thank you for that. What other advisement might you have? Um, definitely, Joe like took the words out of my mouth. Like, yeah. I just wanna say like 100% agree with that. Col I mean, uh, high school is not the end of the line. And some people, so there may be students that feel like that, but there definitely is a million things you can do, whether it's college, military, trade school, or maybe you start your own business. There's a lot of kids in, in high school who creative, like have a trader, create things that you know other people might buy. So I think definitely for educators now, like you know, it's okay to go the extra mile. Like if school ends at three and you can clock around three thirty, I think if you stay maybe extra fifteen minutes, you don't know who you can impact in those. 15 minutes of just staying extra at work. And I think that's important because there's a lot of students who look up to educators and, you know, like us, we, we all have by a handful of, of people that we think about, oh man, this person told me this when I was younger and look where we are today. Absolutely. Oh my God. I have so many candidates for Secretary of Education <laughs> sitting right here. You guys are giving some great advice. And if only we go that extra mile, if we could stay a few minutes to inspire we, who we don't know how we may impact students. So thank you so much for that. And you're absolutely correct. Skylar. Um, I was grateful enough that my school had languages, but I really believe that languages are super important because when you learn a language, you're, you can open up the door to speaking to billions and millions of other people. So I really wish that the American school system gave people the opportunity to speak languages like Chinese, Arabic, Russian, things of that sort rather than just Spanish. And then when they do learn Spanish, it's like kind of like, they started in sixth grade. Well, I feel like by sixth grade, it's too late. We need to start teaching kids these languages like 
young as soon as like kindergarten yeah. so they can start being fluent at it and then they can speak to other people so just making sure that we introduce world languages right because we're not the only ones on this planet we have people who speak so many different languages and the opportunities that will open for you by speaking a variety of languages the number one spoken language in america in the next couple of years will be mandarin chinese that, not America, excuse me, the number one spoken language in the world, pardon my language, will be Mandarin Chinese, right? And so I remember being in Ghana a couple of weeks ago, and I visited a classroom in a small village in West Ghana. And one of the little boys in the classroom said to me, how many languages do you speak? And he was so excited to ask me that question, and I was so embarrassed. Because here's this little boy in elementary school who spoke four languages fluently, and here I am, well-educated, <laughs> multiple degrees, and I'm fluent in one language. Now, I understand a little bit of here, a little bit of French. You know, I have a Haitian Creole population in my school district, so I understand a little, I understand a little bit of Espanol. But other than that, I mean, conversational, but to be able to hold a conversation, to be able to engage in trade, to be able to hold a job where, you know, other folks will speak another language and so I can help a company to grow. I don't have that, but there are children around the world who do, right? So I agree with you, just making sure that world languages exist and we can expose American children to so many different cultures, mm -hmm. right? Awesome. Anyone else? So let me, let me just ask, one other question. You guys are in college, you finish high school, and I think you guys finish high school at the top of your game. So I know that everyone here on this panel had an amazing GPA. Sanaya kind of showed off a little bit when she responded, <laughs> I, she got hers in. I appreciate that. You guys are just brilliant, right? What skill sets must a high school student have when they enter college? What are some of those skills that they must have aside academic? So put academic to the side. What else do you need to be successful in college? What do you think? Harshita? I think it. just being a very socially motivated person. Like if you do not open your mouth and speak to people, you it's really, really, really difficult to succeed in college. Like public speaking, social skills, like, like everyone said, like your relationships in college are so, so, so important. Like whether they're with your professors, with your peers, with like leaders on your campus, or even like with just regular staff in the dining hall, mm -hmm. janitors, like having conversations and being able to say like, I know this person or like walking into a room and being able to like greet somebody like that, that is so important and like, having you can have the same conversation with the janitor that you can have with the head of your school the president of your university and both can take you such a long way so like i think like having like social skills is such an important thing going into college all right principals superintendents directors school boards we need to have social skills if we're going to truly prepare students to be college and career ready okay what other skills might we need oh skyla then joseph um, advocacy, you have to advocate in college for yourself. Um, because if you don't advocate, you will fall behind. And the professors, they have like 200 students, so they can't keep track of all their students. So that means if you need to push yourself to go to that office hour, go to that office hour. If you need to, if you need help, advocate. Even if it's teachers, sometimes teachers, like they mess up your grades and things of that sort. And I had times where I had to like fight to get my grade, even like to get it to an A sometimes. and just having that fight or that advocacy for yourself really takes you a long way in life, period. Self-advocacy. We've got to instill those skills in our children, starting at high school. I would even dare say, even mm -hmm. in middle school, at least, and then gradually help students to become self-advocates. Joseph. Those two definitely okay. I agree with. <laughs> and, um, um, I think, you know, it might be annoying at this point, but time management is a real thing. Can we talk about time management? Yeah, that... I mean, folk my age need time management <laughs> yeah. skills. So, yeah, can we talk about that? Yeah, definitely time management. I mean, you know, high school, at least you have a little bit of structure, but when you go to college, you know, you make your own schedule. You're joining whatever clubs you want to join. you got to be able to manage that on top of, okay, I need to eat dinner, eat, eat throughout the day. I need to maybe go to the gym. I need to get a job. Like, time management... It, it, it's hard for a lot of people, you know, it was hard for me. Um, 
because you want to do so much, but you know you only have 24 hours yeah, in a day yeah. and you have to sleep. Um, so yeah, I think learning how to time manage yeah. will definitely help you in college. Yeah. And I think another thing too is like leadership skills. You know, everyone's a leader in their own way. Some people don't like to talk and tell the people what to do, or like they like to work from behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But you're still a leader if you're working behind the scenes. That's and I right. think you know, That's right. leaders can do anything, and you influence your friend, a neighbor, like anyone. And I think with those two things, you'll be very successful. So college. teaching time management, mm -hmm. which is essential, right? Because when you're in high school, you get a schedule. Someone gives you that schedule, and you follow the schedule, right? It's routine every day, right? College is a little different. You kind of make your own schedule. Mm -hmm. And having idle time, if you don't know how to use that idle time, you can misuse it in college. I remember, and I know things haven't changed, there were students on my campus who did not know how to use the idle time properly. And it really was to their detriment, right? And so you're right, time management is essential. Making sure if you're gonna pick a class and you're gonna work, that, you, that, that the time that you pick your class coincides with your work schedule, because um, that can also be problematic. I love that, that is so true. You know, I'm starting to learn more and more of what you said earlier about having that week long session on transition to college as a senior, all of what you said, the three of you, and I didn't hear from our virtual friends yet. I mean, those skill sets can be taught and emphasized just alone. All right, Joe, Jackie, and Sanaya, we want to hear from you guys. What must we need? Give me the skill sets that every college student must have. Yeah, so I um, wanted to touch on failure a little bit. I think it's um, important to be comfortable with failure, not complacent, where it's okay to fail a class or something like that, and you think, oh, whatever, oh, whatever. But to be comfortable with it, to be comfortable with failing an exam, to be comfortable with you know not turning in that homework assignment because something came up or you needed the day, um, to be comfortable talking to your teachers about, hey, I failed this, what do I do going forward? And there's been plenty of times where I've been able to go to a teacher and say, you know what, look, I bombed this test horribly, and what can I do? And a lot more times than not, they'll, they'll try to help and work with you. Um, so, you know, in high school, you, you don't really think of it that, that much. The teachers are there every day. They're, they're working with you one-on-one, -on -one. but, um, like Skylar said, you have to be your own advocate. And I think getting comfortable with failure is going to help a lot to be able to advocate for yourself to fix that failure so that you can, you know, try to really achieve, um, your, the best really. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, Joe, too, just that's a skill set that we need as we also well into adulthood, you know, um, oftentimes we fear failure. But it's failure is what makes us better, right? It like it continues to um, to build our capacity, right? To be successful. I always say that not to fear it, but to learn from it, right? So thank you. That's a very powerful response. All right, Sanaya, what do we need? Um, I feel like I didn't know like how to really take care of myself until I got to college. Like I was always on go. Like I treated myself and my body as if I'm this machine. And I just had to be like, had to make good grades all the time. I have to go here. I have to go there. You will literally drain yourself if you don't take care of you physically, emotionally, and mentally. So I feel like that's something that we need to stress even more because you come to college just thinking, okay, I have to do this. I have to go here. You don't have to go everywhere. You don't have to do this. Take care of yourself because if you don't, then you're not going to finish. You're going to burn yourself out. Can we talk about burnout? Can we talk about wellness just for a hot second? And I promise just a hot second. You know, we don't spend enough time talking to people your age about wellness and burnout because it's people my age who are talking about it and it's too late for us to talk about it. We should be talking about it at your age so that we are prepared for wellness when we do get older. Wellness is so important and you're right, you can burn yourself out if you don't manage your time properly, if you're not advocating for yourself, if you're not using your social skills. You are absolutely right. Wellness is so very important. Eating properly. You know you college kids don't eat right. How many times do you get phone calls from your parents asking, what did you eat today? Right? Okay. Yeah, I know, Joe. I know. <laughs> what did you eat today? Did you eat? We ask all kinds of questions. I'm going to take it a little bit further. Did you eat? What did you do? Are you going to the bathroom regularly? Right? We ask, are you exercising? Right? Are you taking good care of yourself? These things are important. Excellent. 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 Jackie, what will we, what will we need? I would definitely say not being afraid to have an open mind. 
and not being afraid to know that plans are going to change and that things change. I think now, especially that I've graduated and now that I'm actually working in higher education and I'm on the other side of it and I'm on the administrative side of it, it's really been an eye-opening experience um, and just talking with prospective students and working with students and knowing like you may go in thinking that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, but you're going to come out doing ABC and that's okay. And even when I went into school, I had like an idea of things that I wanted to do, but I tried other stuff and changed my plan and it was okay. And just, I think going along with that, being very flexible and just being ready to adapt, especially as someone who went during COVID and not knowing what was going to happen next or whether I was even going to make it two weeks into school without being sent home, like knowing like sometimes it's okay to go with the flow and just like be prepared for that. All right, principals, directors, teachers, superintendents, school board members, anyone that has any influence on what it is that we teach our students. You heard from six brilliant, brilliant individuals, young people, end users, on what it is that we need to do to prepare students for college. We didn't even talk about the career. That's gonna be part two of the show. That's another day. I'll bring them back to talk about that. But just the college experience, being flexible, being not to fear failure, to take good care of yourself, wellness, time management, having social skills and good communication skills, being an advocate for oneself. Those are the skills that are needed for the jobs of the future as well. When you look at what research says that children need to be able to think about and be able to do to be prepared for jobs for 2030, and as you know, 85% of the jobs in the year 2030 do not exist today, but there are particular skills that they may need these six individuals talked about those skills. What we can do at high schools is start to prepare our scholars, our students, for college experiences and the world of work. I'm going to ask these six people to be advisors once again. This is my last question for the show. As you know, we are in the midst of a presidential election. We're not going to talk about our political affiliation because we don't need to. But we do know that education does need an overhaul. And as a 30-year educator, I'm the first to say there are things that we can do better. We had an opportunity during the pandemic to reimagine education. And everyone talked about reimagining education. You heard that phrase. Let's reimagine how we do things. And when the pandemic ended, we went back to what we knew best and what was comfortable. Everything that we thought was wrong with education, we went back to doing. We did not really reimagine. We have an opportunity to reimagine education once again. And oftentimes when a president is elected, they will bring in a new secretary of education. And that is the person who's responsible for education throughout America. If you were to sit down with the presidential candidates, current Vice President Harris, former President Trump, and you had to give advisement on what they should focus on as it relates to education in the United States. In two sentences, tell me what would you say? How would you advise them? It's fully loaded. Go ahead, Joe. Two sentences might be hard because you know I talk a lot, but. You know what? <laughs> I'm not going to limit you. I'm not going to limit you. Give the advice. All right. I personally think that we're looking in the wrong area. Everyone says reimagine education and you can't start with higher education. Um, I think you have to start in these underserved communities and communities where maybe education is not um, easily accessible. We don't have the resource. It all goes back to resources. If you don't have the resources to um, instill in students, you're not going to have um, high achieving students. So especially in these underserved areas where maybe um, the family unit is not making as much money or um, maybe they just don't have access to it. They don't have a car. They, they don't have you know a way to get their children to somewhere to where they can further their education. You're not going to get these kinds of students in higher education. And that will help with everything. Diversity, that'll help with higher testing scores. That'll help, you know, all across the board. Um, so I think really looking at these communities that are underserved and um, could help with a little more resources would be perfect. If we are going to move our country forward, we need to start with the underserved communities. That's why, Joe, you're going to be Secretary of Education. 
<laughs> I, you, you really are. Like, you, you, you're amazing. Like, the way you think, I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Kudos to you. Who else wants Thank to? Thank you. You're welcome, my dear. Harshita and then Jackie? I would say piggybacking off of what Joe said. I think what he said was also amazing. <laughs> um, but I think that um, also rather than like, I feel like the big thing about college is acceptance or being deterred away from the college. Why is it always that like, you know, like, yes, you may not be up there with the candidates that you do accept into the college, but give them an option, give them maybe a program they can do to still, cause like in a lot of cases, like colleges don't realize like, yes, you defer them away, but like now what? you were like could have been their only opportunity to make it up there you could have mm. been like that could be their goal in life like once i make it to this college like i will become this one day and like that one difference can like change their life forever Absolutely. so like maybe like giving them more opportunity rather than just simply turning them away like and like you said underprivileged like some underprivileged people have the skill set to attend like huge universities that people who have like who are blessed with the opportunity to apply there like they do apply there but like underprivileged people wouldn't even think about it but they have maybe even better skill sets than the people that attend the university so i think like giving people like that opportunity regardless of yes like their social status but even if they're not good on paper like give them programs that they can try to maybe make it there one day like don't just completely like squish and like say no. So diversifying the enrollment process at colleges, right? And what that does for the student, it also, it, it helps the college to have the student body to be of diverse backgrounds. And I think that, you know, the American education system, the American, America period is a very diverse country, right? And so the colleges should reflect what we see in America. So I totally agree with you. I think that's all. You guys are super amazing. Like the advisement you're giving, like really, it's you. Sh we should be paying for this. Honestly, <laughs> it is amazing. Skylar, your thoughts. What would you say to both uh, former President Trump as well as Vice President Harris as they are thinking about candidates for Secretary of Education? What should be their focus? I feel like maybe giving children the opportunity like to be more well-rounded. I feel like everything in K through 12 is just very like lecture, math, science, history, but it's not enough like how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with depression, how to deal with things at home, like social skills. And I feel like sometimes it just feels like robotic or, okay. you know, I feel like a robot. And sometimes in college, like I, and want to experience burnout. So I had to, in college, really learn, like, it's okay to take a day off just to, like, reset. Okay. And I feel like that's not really normalized through K through 12 because everything is just so on go. So I wish that there was more of, like, a wellness aspect or teaching people how to, even with social skills, how to, how to like, make friends or giving students the opportunity to be socialize with more people okay. is super important. All right, so we have the academic aspect, but there needs to be um, an intentional social emotional wellness aspect to the K-12 structure. That, that's what I heard yeah. you say. That's Absolutely. smart. You're teaching them skills that they will use for the rest Absolutely. of their lives. Mm -hmm. And we're starting very early in nurturing those skills. That is absolutely, that's great, that's awesome. Anybody else, Jackie? What's your advisement? This is a big meeting you're having, Jackie. With, <laughs> with big politicians here, what would you say? I'm thinking just giving students the opportunity to get outside of the classroom and apply what they've learned in school and apply it to the real world. I think some of the most memorable like memories I have of going K through 12 were the field trips that I took and like going to those different places and getting having like a really fun day, but also having like an educational day as well with it. And I think it's really important just to get students like outside of their classes and like outside of a different mindset and put them somewhere else, whether that look like a community service going to a museum or like going to maybe like a senior citizen home and like talking with other people and like having these other experiences and taking what you've learned and applying it elsewhere and working outside. And I think that also stems from working with like mental health and having like a lot more resources for students to be able to kind of communicate those needs and have just those like extra resources and opportunities for students. So what Jackie is describing and those of us who are in the K-12 um, sector 
Jackie is describing experiential learning. That is something that I have been advocating for ever since I was a teacher. Experiential learning is the best form of learning. That is the learning that takes place outside of the classroom. That's the real world application. I think what we do in the classroom is fascinating. But if you take what you do in the classroom and be able to apply it outside of the classroom, that's where the learning takes place, right? Real world application. Brilliant. You guys are super brilliant. Um, who's going to go next, Anaya or Joseph? Okay, Sanaya. You're such a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say like just taking yourself like out of your shoes and looking at the whole picture and how like America, like it's so diverse. So taking away that diversity, what do we have? I mean, like we need to learn like our history and stuff like that, but also I feel like ask the kids, like literally ask the kids, what do they need? And like, how can we help them and grant other opportunities? Because not everybody has the same opportunities. I know for me and my work first, my work workforce, I have to make my opportunities because I'm a female and I'm not an athlete. So I have to make my own opportunities because they're not, there's not a lot of sports opportunities out there unless you like literally go looking and advocating for yourself. But I feel like also like in high school, it would have helped me if there was like a panel of something and I could have asked right. college students like, hey, how is this? And how can I do this? And like, is this major like right for me? I feel like that would have helped me. And it would have, I got set back a year because I didn't like really know my major. And I feel like if I would have known early on, but I feel like I had to go through what I had to go through to get to where I am now. So I think little stuff like that like really does matter. Just yeah, looking so, at the whole situation. Right. So, so you know, what Sanaya described, I will tell you in my school district, and thank you for that, and you didn't know this, I have a superintendent student advisory. Giving student voice and agency and hearing from the end users, similar to what we're doing now. And what you're saying, Sanaya, is that this should be required through schools, at, at schools throughout the country, where students have a seat at the table to help with the decision making. I love that, because they should. They really should. You know, school boards more and more are actually have a student representative to sit in school boards. So when those decisions are made, you're hearing a student perspective. I think that is so powerful. And I think that both presidential candidates would benefit from hearing how important it is to hear from our nation's students. I think that's great. All right, Joseph, you're up. You heard some gr five great <laughs> pieces of advice. Take us home. Um, I definitely think that Investing more in our education system is important and really getting to those communities like Joe said and um, everybody else did, like really getting to those communities where there's kids who can't go to school or maybe there's kids that went to school and now they had to work to help back home. Like right. we, we really need to invest and get to those, to those students um, so we can be a well-educated country. So yeah. Everyone has an education, whether it's you know, maybe just through high school or all the way through college, like some form of education for everyone and um, giving everyone that equal opportunity is very important for, I, I think, us to move forward as a nation because the kids in kindergarten now, you don't know who will be sitting, who will be our next president or, That's right. or who's going to be the next lawyer or judge or That's a right. teacher. So, That's right. you know, starting from the bottom and teaching them young and changing now is only going to help us have better leaders in the future. I love that. I love that. You guys are amazing. Um, you, again, represent the promise of America, each and every one of you. And I just hope my audience is feeling the cold chills that I feel when I hear you all speak about what America could possibly be. If we give our young people the voice, the agency that's happening here on Strictly Education across America, I think we can improve our K-12 experiences. I really do believe that. You guys are the end users, you know what you need, right? You're the ones who are experiencing college and going into the workforce after graduating, right? You have given such powerful pearls of wisdom and advice at such a young age, and I could not be more honored to have you all as my guests. And what I am hoping is that my audience will take in all of what you've said and as they are planning with opening of schools, and I know some schools in the Southeast have already started in, in some places now, but it's not too late to implement so much of what you said. 
it's a matter of being creative. And a lot of what you said doesn't cost a lot of money, right? Because in school districts, we also have to worry about our budget, right? It doesn't cost a lot of money. It just requires a little bit of creativity, a little bit of thinking a little differently, and moving away from some of the traditions and moving into more innovation. One of the things that I'm gonna to contribute to this conversation, if I had an opportunity to sit with both of those candidates and, and talk to them about my experience as an educational leader, what I'd like to see, all of what you said is spot on, but let's not forget financial literacy. I was gonna say that. Jackie talked about budgeting very early on. Financial literacy is so important. I don't know if this still happens, but when I was in college, I remember credit card companies coming on campus and giving us all credit cards. And we didn't know what to do with them. We were like, sign me up. And not realizing that I can go shopping and hang out, Joe, and do all kinds of things and eat out at all restaurants. And guess what? I got to pay for it at the end of the month, right? And so some of us got into debt and not even realizing what in the world we were doing. So we want to teach our young people how to invest, right? How to manage their money, how to, you know, budget their funding. You know, what to do when you get paid. We just don't go shopping. How to pay yourself first, right? And how to invest. These are the things that's going to keep America moving. This is what's going to keep the engine of America moving if we are all financially responsible, right? So that we don't have to worry about these underprivileged communities. We can break these generational cycles of debt and poverty by educating folk. So I just want to say again, I thank you guys for your time. I thank you for your energy, and I just want the audience to know that these six brilliant young people gave up a Saturday morning to be on the show, and I think that what they have contributed to the show is powerful, just powerful. So thank you. Um, good luck in your future endeavors and what you're going to do. Whoever will be working with you in the future will be the absolute luckiest people to work with you all. You have so much to contribute to this world not just America, but to this world, so much to contribute. And I know there are so many other students who are just like you. I'm so honored and I cannot wait to see what you all are to become in the next several years. You are the promise and you are the hope. You are the American dream. Thank you all. Strictly Education, thank you for your time. Again, I hope that the administrators, the leaders, the educators who are watching this show and those who are just interested in moving our country forward would just take in what these young people have shared with us and embrace it and apply it. They are the future of this country. They are what's going to make our world a better place for the next generation. I look forward to seeing you at the next Strictly Education. Thank you.